Hello, everybody, and welcome to this video where I answer questions that you questioned me with. So this is already the most riveting thing I've ever done. So let's get to it. I'm going to try really hard to pronounce everyone's names correctly. So, right here, first question from Nanya Business. Has being a booktuber influenced your writing? How you view your writing or how you see yourself as a writer? If so, how? Um, I would say no to this question, but what I would say on the flip side of that is that being a writer has influenced the way I view my booktubing, if that makes any sense. Like, being a writer has made me look at what videos to make differently, um, what things to say about the videos differently, and saying it in a way that is different, I hope, than what most people talking about the same books would say, if that makes any sense. Like coming at it from a different perspective. Um, and he has a few questions here. And the second one is, what in your opinion is the best book to film adaptation? And is it a good adaptation because it effectively translate the ideas of the original or because it approves on the source material by removing unnecessary clutter? Well, first off, right off the bat, um, if we're talking about a, a movie that removes unnecessary clutter, I would say um, Stephen King or Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Hands down. It's one of my favorite movies. It is so weird. It is so fun. The look of it is amazing. Um, and it takes a lot of stuff out of The Shining that um, was kind of, ugh, like, unnecessary for me. Anyway, um, if we're talking about a book that is very much or as much as one can be, based on the original source material, I would say Clockwork Orange because um, there wasn't a script for Clockwork Orange. They actually had the book in their hand and they would go, okay, we're going to do this part now. And they would do the part right out of the book. Um, an odd idea based off of that, man, I'm very Kubrick-centric at the moment. Um, 2001 A Space Odyssey is weird because Arthur C. Clarke was hired to write the script and the novel. And the novel was written while he was writing the script, or like right after, but based on his script. So it's like a weird novelization, but not quite, because a novelization is usually some other schmuck like, watches a movie and said, okay, now write this fucking book, or gets a script and is like, write this fucking book. But Arthur C. Clarke got to do, like, both at the same time, so that's really interesting. But my favorite, favorite... Oh, you know what I will throw in? Jaws, because of that horrible um, affair bit in it, where the movie was better than the book. Um, but I think my favorite film adaptation is Naked Lunch. And the reason being is because it's not about Naked Lunch. Like, there's parts of it that are about Naked Lunch. But it's also more about William Burroughs and um, kind of the making of Naked Lunch in a really weird meta way. And then also parts of William Burroughs' life like the accidental death of his wife and all this other shit um, <clears throat> that I, I, I was just done in such a dreamy like wonderful way it's just it's one of my favorite movies too and then if we're gonna 
keep doing this fear and loathing in las vegas just because um wow that surprised me um have you ever held a grudge against a writer you hadn't read based on what you heard about their writing only to pick up one of their books and find you actually liked it i saw this when it came in like when you asked the question and i thought about it for a minute and i couldn't think of anything but the thing that I think I will answer this with is that I have been more than vocal about how I think Stephen King ruined a lot of stuff and how he's a paper salesman and all this other shit and um, not too happy with his novels but his short stories are really fucking good. Like, he nails his short stories. Um, there are very few short stories of his that I've read that I was like, eh. But, um, so, giving credit where credit's due, if you haven't read Stephen King's short stuff, um, and start from, the like, way back when. Like, don't pick up something new, because I have no idea. Like, I think the last thing of his I read was like mid nineties. So, um, I can't vouch for anything past that, but like skeleton crew was at four past midnight. Is that what it is? Even different seasons is good. I mean, they're kind of long and annoying, but like his short stuff is really, really good. Like, so thank you, Nanya for the question. NP hunt says congratulations matt thank you sir could not have done this without you um what is the best piece of advice you would give to a severe introvert who wants to market their book slash writing hire a marketing agency or hire a um social media manager i have been wanting to do this for so long because I hate marketing, but I also, once I finish writing something, I'm done. I'm, I'm on to the next thing. Like, I don't want to, it's like, this is kind of the best way I could put it. Let's say you're in a relationship with somebody, okay? And the relationship was really long or whatever, or not even that long, but let's say it was a good length relationship. You guys break up, Okay your partner moves out the relationship's over you're by yourself but you still make two plates for dinner you still um, only sleep on one side of the bed you still buy two tickets when you go to the movies that's what it feels like to me when I finish something and I'm trying to work to sell it afterwards like, I'm not a good salesman. I'm a creator. I create things. I make things. And usually, when I'm finishing up a project, I already have the next project in mind. So the whole concept of marketing, like, to me, is just, like, mind-numbing. But I've been wanting to hire somebody. But honestly, I can't justify the cost right now. I just can't. So... Um, eventually someday I will hire someone to do all that shit for me. Um, because the, the other stuff is get a newsletter, but you have to send your newsletter out all the time. If you're collecting email addresses and you never write to your people, like it's useless to have. And then by the time you finally send them an email, they won't even know who the fuck you are and they'll unsubscribe. So you have to be consistent with all that shit with, and I'm bad at that. With your social media, a lot of people think you need to be on everything, every form of social media. I would say pick one that you feel comfortable using and fucking take that to the nth degree. Like, you are the lord of that social media thing. After that, you can move on to another one if you feel like you can. 
Um, BookBub, try to get a BookBub. Um, if you're putting your book out on Amazon, that costs money and you have to plan your book launch with when you could get in because normally when you get in with BookBub, it's like months away. So you have to like plan all this shit out. And I'm very um, impatient. So when I finish a book, I want it out next week. You know, I like seriously, I have here. Let me let me shill. Los Angeles chapbook by Matt Wall. This comes out on Tuesday. This has been made, created since last month. And I've been hanging on to it. Do you know how fucking much pressure that puts on me? How much stress? I'm the most impatient person on the fucking planet. So, um, honestly, hire someone, find someone who could be your business manager if you're really bad at this. Hopefully it's someone you trust who you don't think will fuck you and um, go about that way. What are the best nonfiction books about poetry or writing in general? Oh my God. Okay, are you ready? Oh, I wish I had them. On Writing by Bukowski. The Mathematics of the Breath and the Way by Bukowski. So these two books, like, godsends. Like, these are the best there are, period. And then um, I would say, especially if you are into um, pulp writing or the concept behind pulp writing for your fiction, um, James Scott Bell wrote a book called How to Write Pulp Fiction. It's fucking amazing. I love that book. And here's what I'll say. Most how-to writing books are 90% trash that you've heard from anybody, even someone who is not in the business. Like, if your mom's like, well, if you want to write a book, I guess you're going to have to sit down and start typing. Like, yeah, no shit. Like, that's pretty much the advice in every writing book. You know, ass and chair, hand on keyboard. Um, but usually every book will have some gem that you've never heard from in another book before. And that gem is usually the reason why they thought in the first place that they should even write a book about it. So, um, yeah, uh, those three books for sure. And then, um, I'm trying to remember the name of that book and it was really good, but it's probably outdated now because a lot of it had to do with, um, Amazon publishing, but, uh, is it Sean Platt and his fucking guys? I can't remember the other names like Dave and um, Dave Wright and I don't know, Johnny Two Socks or something like that. I can't remember what his fucking name is. But they wrote a book called, um, oh, it was called Write, Publish, Repeat. That book was really good. But I, I don't know if it if it holds up anymore. And then I know they put out another book called, I think it's called The Fiction Formula. And I can't remember if I read that or not. And I also vaguely remember them updating Write, Publish, Repeat. But they updated it and changed the name of it, I think. So I don't know what to tell you about that. It It was good, especially if you're trying to write a lot and put stuff out. Like when I was reading that stuff, that was like around the time I was still doing serials. I think I went to monthly serials. I was doing weekly and um, I was getting burnt out. So, um, but yeah, it was pretty good. And um, what is the best piece of advice in area of life you've ever been given? Who? Good Lord here. I'm probably going to have to say this in a few different ways. And I think it all comes back to the same thing. But don't... And I can't even remember who gave me this advice. Maybe it's advice I gave myself just like talking myself off the ledge. <laughs> but um, like time waits for no one, first off. Um, time is continually moving. And if you don't do the things that you want to do with your life, if you don't chase your dreams, if you don't follow your shit, 
there will come a day when you look back and you go, why the fuck didn't I do that thing? Why the fuck did I wait so long? And that's a horrible fucking feeling. And I've done a lot of shit, but I still, every once in a while, look back and go, God damn it, I didn't do that thing. I wish I would have fucking done that thing. And regret is a bitch. And you can't, you can't cure regret. Like you could put a band-aid on it or you could go, well, I'll do it now. But you're, you're always going to have that thing in your head where, but if I did it then, what would things be like now? So just know that if this was a movie or if this was a book and you're the protagonist of the book, the antagonist, the villain of the book is time and it's coming for you. And the sad part about it is, is that time is eventually going to win. Like, our life is a tragedy. Like, a tragic play, okay? We, like, are going to lose. But it's how much we can win before we lose that is going to be the thing that, like, speaks of our life, if that makes any sense. Fuck, that got deep and dark. Thanks for the question. <laughs> no, I honestly hope that's helpful. Because, like, I mean, people could, like, beat you over the head with shit forever. But until you sit there and go, oh, fuck. Like, that's when it's a big thing. Okay, anyway. So, Bell Bottom Blues asks... Oh, well, there's a congratulations there. So, thank you. Um... Do you like to read time travel books? There was a period where I really, really did. But most of the time when I read time travel books, I always felt like something was wrong. I'm like, oh, they could have done that. Or, man, I wish this would have happened. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just like you start getting really excited about shit. The thing that sucks is when it's a time travel book about a time period that you know about and the author gets something wrong. And then you're like, how the fuck did that happen? How did that... Who in editorial let that fucking slide? And then you start going, well, the editors obviously don't fucking know. Like, how the fuck could they have done that? So that's where I get um, kind of like... That hasn't happened very much, but I think there's been two times I could remember... What shows are you watching on TV slash streaming now? Um, I don't watch TV. I was actually watching The Office a little bit again. And that's just some good fun to, like, cheer you up kind of thing. But um, I don't watch movies anymore. And I don't watch TV anymore. I don't even have a TV now. And there's not anything inherently wrong with it but I just got very cynical because I worked in like the low budget world of filmmaking and shit for so long and pitched to networks and did stupid shit um, filmed pilots that never fucking did anything and there's still a part of me that would love to get, like, my Black Star series made into a TV show. I would fucking love that. I don't know. It's just, like, there's a lot of jadedness. It's, like, the... What do you call it? Like, uh, you know that, like, innocent thrill you have? Um, especially when you're a kid. And um, the astonishment you have about certain things. The magic, you know? Um, I was enamored with the magic of Hollywood from a very young age. And when I got into it and saw how it worked and saw how things happened, it left a really bad taste in my mouth. So I kind of fell off the wagon, so to speak, with that. Um, and I think the reason why I could still read books is because, for the most part, it's at least for writing, I don't have to depend on anybody else. I could just write a book, and then the, I wrote the story, I wrote the poem, I wrote the book. 
And when I read books, it's fairly easy because there aren't as many working parts in it that could fuck it up, like from other places. And um, there are exceptions to that rule, of course. But so basically right now, um, I'm not really watching anything. What genre of music do you like? I like all sorts of stuff. I like doo-wop. I like old, old country. Um, I like Delta Blues in Chicago, like Chess Records Blues. Um, I like ska, first wave, second wave, third wave, um, LA punk, UK punk, um, some reggae, some rock steady. Um, I like uh, pop music, like really, like fucking Lady Gaga, like Yes Please. And I'm really into Lizzo right now, um, which is weird. But um, anything odd, I usually gravitate to. Something that I either want my music so fucking cookie cutter catchy or so fucking out there weird. Like um, folk music, black metal. Um, you know, like, I'm pretty much open to everything, as long as it's good, reggaeton, you know, um, all sorts of shit, but, like, honestly, like, my favorite bands of all time, if I had to do that to give you a, a little hint, would probably be the Cramps, the Specials, the Rolling Stones, Black Flag, the Misfits. Yeah. I also love a good um, female vocalist. I'm actually going to be doing a video on my favorite female vocalists pretty soon here. That will be accompanied by a playlist. So that'll be fun. Um, you rock. All right. Next up, Penny. Um... Question one, it's a zombie apocalypse. The end of the world as we know it. You have to go on the road. So after, of course, so after the essentials, you have room for three books in your backpack. There's a part of me that's like, well, I have this like um, backpack solar kit to give me power that like folds up. It's like this big. So if I had that, and I just had one Kindle, and I filled the Kindle up with all of the ebooks I have on my computer. Would that work? If not, probably um, this book, because this is my go to put in a backpack book. And honestly, this book is usually sitting in my backpack for trips. So, probably that. Oh, since we're doing that kind of like the whole desert island thing, um, I'd probably take. Um, conspiracy against the human race just so I wouldn't feel so bad about the world ending. I don't know. Either a book of like really dirty jokes or um, erotica. I don't have an erotica book in my head that I could think of. I could see that that would be useful if there was a zombie apocalypse or the zombie survival guide, which isn't a very good book. So, uh, Bushcraft 101. That's what I'll go with. Okay. Whew. Took me a minute to get all around that. Oh, I'm sorry. You. There was more to that. Um, which three would you grab on your way out the door? Don't necessarily have to be your favorite, but books you would never tire of reading. Well, there you go. I had primitive technology on that other list, too. So I'd have to go back and forth if I would think that would be better than Bushcraft 101. It might be, because I might need to make charcoal, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, question two. What was your favorite song, group, singer, album when I was 16? I would say either The Ramones, Rancid, or Social Distortion. Because 14 was when I got into The Misfits and Black Flag. And the Ramones, for that matter. But I was still listening to the Ramones. So, um, yeah. I, 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 that sounds pretty solid. So, thank you, Penny. 
Bunny says, what is the best thing made of potato? Um, probably fries or chips to those um, across the pond. Dude, I could eat fucking french fries all the fucking time, dude. Like, there's never, like, a time when you're like, oh, do I want french fries? It's like, yes, yes, you do. Of course you fucking do. Fries are fucking good. Eat the fucking fries. Um, Lisa asks, do you like to reread? Like, constantly. I am, um, there's probably medication I should go on to help me from rereading. Um, what made you decide to start this channel? I started this channel because I read a lot of pulp, um, like a lot of like weird fiction and hard-boiled detective fiction. And at the time, there wasn't a channel that I knew of that um, like talked about the books that I wanted talking about. I was reading a lot of William S. Burroughs at the time, too. And I think I was reading Junkie. Um, when I decided to start the channel with, and then I'm like, oh, paperback junkie, cause I'm reading junkie and I like paperbacks and blah, 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 blah. So that was like that whole thing. Do you have an all time favorite book and a most hated book? Okay. If we want to look at it in the sense of how long I've been reading it and how often I've read it, probably Frankenstein by Mary Shelley is... Like, the book I've probably have had, or... Because even when I was a kid, I had, like, abridged versions of it. Um, I've always loved that book, and I've loved that story. And I love the misunderstood monster. And, like, just the sadness of, I guess, like, trying to get your father's approval. You know, or acceptance, or love and um, not ever being able to do it, you know, and have that be, like, the crux of your life. It's very relatable. And then, um, but honestly, I probably have read Breakfast of Champions by Kurt Vonnegut more than any other book. I've, I've read that book a gajillion times. I've owned tons of copies of that book. It's the book I've lent out and never got back more often than not, and I never bitched about it because I was always excited to go to the store and buy another copy of it. Yeah, Breakfast of Champions and Frankenstein. For sure, yeah. Um, Gail, I have a pretty good idea of what you usually read, but if you were going to read outside your normal range, what type genre would you choose? I actually read a lot of different genres. Like, I read... Like, I mainly... Now, I mainly read poetry and um, weird fiction. But I do read, regardless of what happened yesterday, I do read classics. Um, I read westerns. I read science fiction. I read horror. Um, I'm liking nonfiction a lot more over the last five years than I had growing up, let's say. Um, so I'm trying to think of what genre, I think honestly the only thing that I don't read would probably be like cozy mysteries or like romance books that don't have, like I, when I was in high school, I used to read, um, like gothic romance novels, like the ones with like the chick running from the scary house on the cliffside with the tall grass, you know? and the tree with no leaves on it. I used to love those books, and I used to always feel so... Like, it always gave me the same feeling that, like, Frankenstein would give me, like, this hopeless romantic, this, like, feeling of, like, no matter what, you're never quite going to have the thing. And um, I loved that feeling. But um, I think maybe... Like, this is horrible, but if I'm going to read, like, a romance novel, I want it to be, like, filthy. Like, we're going to get dirty really quick here. Um, but then I tried reading erotica, 
and most erotica I've looked at, and a lot of the reason why I was looking at it was trying to see what could sell so I could try to write some and make a quick buck on Amazon or whatever. Um, the writing about everything else is so shit from the ones I picked up, obviously. And, like, then, like, as soon as, like, the, the sexy time starts, it gets, like, all of a sudden, bitch can write. Like, what the fuck's going on here? Like, whoa, whoa, calm down. Like, those are some words, you know? But, um, so it's always, it always cracks me up. So, um, I don't know. I just hate so much stuff. It makes it hard. What's your favorite food? Breakfast meats. Breakfast meats. Like, I can eat, like, anything. Like, I can eat whatever, but, like, like I'm driving around, let's say. Because I am I never get up early enough for breakfast at most places. But, like, if I pass a jack-in-the-box, like I'll, like, I'll go, oh, my God, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. They're still serving breakfast. I won't even want jack-in-the-box. But the idea that I could eat some sausage and bacon and eggs, I'm like... I need to fucking pull the car over. Like, I need to go in there because they have sausage, bacon, and eggs. Um, but yeah, just like breakfast meats. I'm so easy. It's sad. I'm basic. What are your favorite video games? Do you still buy comics? This is from James. Hello, James. My favorite video games, like Conan Exiles, has been like my favorite modern game since I started playing it like in 2016 like when it first launched um so much has changed oh my god so much has changed in that game but the original legend of zelda um for the nintendo entertainment system is like just such a classic game for me and because there's the zelda randomizer that you could get um it changes what's in all the caves and behind all the burn bushes and all this other shit and it changes the layouts of the dungeons and changes what um, enemies are on each screen so the the Zelda randomizer has made that game like brand new to me I should probably stream some randomizer you guys are like no don't fucking do that um, but I love that and I like I love old Atari I've been meaning to do that because Atari is 50 years old this year um, sorry for everyone who remembers when Atari came out but um, like I love my Atari 2600 and um, I used to fucking play Donkey Kong Mousetrap, Pitfall Asteroids, Combat um, Atlantis Cosmic Arc um, just like centipede like all fucking day like oh my god I could jam that shit anyway um, and do I still buy comics no I haven't bought comics since um no I don't think I have I haven't bought comics since Tom King destroyed Batman and not just destroyed Batman, but um, had to do his cute little thing with Alfred because, you know, he wants to be legendary. When, who was it, Tomasi took over Batman after Tom King, I wanted to get into it so bad, but I was living out in the desert. I was nowhere near a, a place to get comics. And I always was like, well, as soon as I move back, blah, 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 I'm going to start getting caught up again and all this other shit. But the reason why I don't is, and it's not like what people think. It's not like the, this is woke or not woke enough or da, 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 da. It's the fucking editorial at both big companies. Like, so many things can happen with so many of the same characters over the course of whatever that... Like, none of it makes any sense. And that fucking bothers the shit out of me. Like, when you're trying to follow a long story arc, and, like, Batman's over here or something like that, or Spider-Man's over here, and then um, that same day another book came out where Spider-Man is in the same place but doing something completely different, and neither one of them, like, talk about it, and they're... 
It's just, it's so fucking stupid. Both companies are event crazy. Comics are too expensive, um, for especially for what you get. They're smaller now than ever, and they're like anywhere from five to eight bucks. It's fucking stupid. But yeah, just editorial has completely let creators run roughshod over the whole fucking thing and um, just have destroyed so much of what made what made people fans and what made people want to invest in a weekly or bi-weekly story you know or, or yeah whatever so I don't um, are you still buying comics that's interesting and what's your favorite game James Oh, Bundy's back. Do you have a playlist you like best while to listen to while writing? I always write to Lunar Lost, Black Light Smoke Remix, and Pain and Pleasure by Club Amour. I write usually to certain things. So when I was writing like horror shit and stuff like that, I would listen to like death metal or black metal. When I write, like, um, like Hank Bradshaw, um, or when I was writing, like, the Black Star books, I was listening to a lot of doo-wop, because, like, I could imagine those would be the songs on the radio, like, while th those things were going on. So it just depends on what I'm working on, but as far as just, like, normal writing, like, when I'm just writing poetry or something... Um, I have tons of different playlists on my Spotify. There's a lot of ska and a lot of blues. And then every once in a while, like if I get a song stuck in my head from somewhere, like I will start putting together this like ridiculous playlist. And that's how that one playlist um, that I put out last month came about. I had a song in my head, I couldn't get it out. And then that song made me think of another song, made me think of another song. And then all of a sudden I have this playlist of ridiculous music. And so when I put a playlist like that together, that'll get a lot of rotation before I get sick of it. Oh, and I used to write, um, whenever I was writing screenplays for a long time, I was always listening to the cramps. Like, um, the first, like, up until Look Mom No Head, like from Songs the Lord Taught Us to Look Mom No Head, like, always. Um, what are some of your favorite movies? And this is from Bass, Baz Van Dyke, we'll say. Um, I hope I said that right. What are some of my favorite movies? Um, Pink Flamingos by John Waters is one of my absolutely favorites. I used to always say it was polyester because I did kind of like it and I like the scratch and sniff thing. But um, Pink Flamingos is a better movie. Let's just be real. Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me I always really liked but don't watch it if you haven't watched the show Funny Games the original German that kind of changed my life because I was like I want to make people feel like that and if you know what I mean you'll know what I mean when I say that um, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari um, just because of all of the German expressionism shit Let's see, what other movies? Bride of Frankenstein was my favorite movie for a long time. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original. Um, Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock. Although I really like Lifeboat and Rope because he told a story from basically one location. There were some great shots in The Lodger that I really liked. For the most part, I kind of feel that the 80s was really exciting for film because the 70s was like the big explosion. It like made Hollywood fun again. And so the 80s people were reaping that benefit. But it's so sad because we were like right on the cusp of um, DV, which completely fucking ruined cinema, like 100%. And so you had all these amazing things happen in the 80s, like the the Hollywood blockbuster became a fucking thing. You just had all these great, amazing things. And then you end up with a generation of people who never went to film school, which is fine, I didn't go to film school, but th they're working with people who never went to film school and anyone could get a camera and no one understands lighting, no one understands composition. 
Um, they just do stuff that they've seen done in other places. They don't know why things work um, when it does work. And they, it's just like, it's a completely different world. And I'm sure there will come a time, because there's lulls all the time. Like, the 60s was a lull for Hollywood. So it comes in waves, you know. Um, and, like, I'm hoping that, that soon there will be another uh, high point, a high watermark. But I really think a lot of it has to do with the kind of shit William Castle was doing back in the day. I think the film experience needs to be more interactive if theaters are going to remain a thing um, or else everyone's just gonna watch the biggest movie ever on their phone yeah I could go back and forth up and down about this shit all day David what's up congratulations do you play Fortnite I do not there was a time when I was going to start playing PUBG if that's what they called it still was it PUBG I can't remember what it was actually called. And then when Fortnite came out, it just looked so hokey compared to what that other game looked like that I wasn't into it. And here's a good example. Like, I really love Conan, okay? But Valheim looks, and from what, I, what I've heard about it, seems like it does a lot of the things that Conan tries to do, but does it better. But I hate the look of the game. Like, it looks corny. But now here's the other thing. If you came out with another Conan-type game, but it was, like, fucking 8-bit, but played the exact same way as, like, Conan or any other game like that does, I would love it. But there's this weird look that, like, Fortnite has, that Valheim has, that just reminds me of, like, Garden Gnomes. And I'm just, I, it trips me out. So, David, if you can sell me on Fortnite, like, I'll, I'm down. But sell me on it. So, um, with that said, thank you guys so much. This was longer than I thought it would be. That's what she said. So, thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. And um, we'll do this again whenever the fuck I feel like it. Okay? And if you guys have more questions, let me know. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bought my books. Type. Hard. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Creo and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the career of the Anarchy Creo, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.